Alright, so I maxed out um, my phone's memory, so it's going to be part two. Luckily, it's happened to stop at right before I started to talk about uh, the geometry of electric polarization. I just happened to have everything drawn out. So I'm just going to sit over my drew so it doesn't give away the coolness of stuff. So I was talking about expansion and contraction of, of, the, um, of the torus. And so uh, the hexagram the hexagram is a double helix spinning around itself at six different points. There's six twists in this double helix. Um, while in the octagram, as you can see, there's three lines. One, two, three. If you cut one slip, um, there's three. Um, uh, it's a triple helix spinning around itself with eight twists. And so uh, I also mentioned, I remember I mentioned earlier that the pentacle and the rodenkoll, which is also a dodecagram, are all uh, uh, have ratios based off the golden ratio. Um, or Fibonacci sets. Um, uh, the pentacle is a double helix spinning around five times, where a rotating coil dodecagram is a pentagonal helix spinning around 12 times. So think of the 5 12 relation to the, uh, the dodecahedron. Um, there is a symbiosis, which the Mayans understood with their calendar. Um, and so we're going to talk about how the energy moves in a double helix. This guy right here. And so, uh, all our energy that we use electrically is usually based off centrifugal force, yang energy. And so I'm going to use yang and yin and try to use less centri centripetal and centrifugal because they get confusing. Um, centripetal um, being yin, feminine energy, contraction, implosion, masculine energy, uh, yang, cent centrifugal expansion. And so, um, there's a, uh, in a double helix, there is, uh, when, when, usually, when you apply current, and so AC is centrifugal force reversing itself back and forth. DC is just centrifugal force. Tesla understood impulse DC allows for, is, when you pulse it, you create centrifugal force, but when you let it, uh, do its own thing, it then r r does, you know, equal and opposite reaction. It's a triple force. I'll explain that. And so, when you apply yang energy to this, right, it, um, conductors, the, say electrons like to travel on the outside of conductors. That's because you're applying centrifugal force. Compression moves outwards, while, um, the vacuum expansion moves inwards. In centripetal force, you have a flip-flop of those energies where the vacuum moves outwards and the compression moves inwards. And so when you do that, the electrons, which I like to say yang energy, flows on the outside of this double helix. Okay, you're creating the groove lines for the, for the, um, for the compressed um, flow of the ether to move instead of winding wires in helixes um, around, say, a form which we traditionally do um, for everything. <laughs> and so, to view that, um, a cutaway of the double helix figure eight, you have two, you have the compression on the outside and the expansion on the inside. Um, and so, this relates to the geometry of superconductivity. T Cooper pairs, two electrons moving in symbiosis with each other, 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Um, and in between, if you have two compression points on the outside, in between will be expansion. And so, uh, this, is, this is the basis to a, a vortex, compression around expansion. Now what's important is the angular information of these two is 180 degrees. Um, the angles between two compression points to the expansion point is 180 degrees. And so, this is the most unique of all the helixes because of the 180 degree ratio and that there is um, no core for uh, a singularity, which we're going to get into right now. Boom, 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 the triple helix. And so here's a triple helix. This is a staff. I was working on this. The first triple helix I formed in the shop being this is one of the several double helixes, not the first generation. I was able to control 
how smooth it was. This one it was a little hard to keep it smooth, being the first, so I turned it more into a staff. I'm going to put crystal in this tomorrow. Do, do, do. And so in a triple helix. Um, oh, before I got in the triple helix, I forgot to mention, when you pulse this, you create a magnetic field as the compression moves to the um, outside forms of the double helix. The magnetic field builds up, which is flow. You're creating a flow of energy. Well, when you can no longer, when you're no longer feeding that with centrifugal force, the flow has to collapse. The magnetic field collapses, and when you let it collapse, instead of using AC to reverse that magnetic field, you let centripetal force take over, which has a flip-flopping of the energies. We have compression in the core and expansion on the outside. Um, and so, when the magnetic field collapses, your electrons or negative charge go down the a straight line right to the bottom while the expansion moves along the outside. Um, now, in a triple helix, what you have is you have three compression points on the outside, your yang energy, and then your yang energy is at the intersections of these three tubes. Um, and um, in between that, you would have three more compression points. So, the angular information between the compression to the expansion is 30 degrees, and from this expansion point to these two compression points is 30 degrees. You're creating a fractal geometry of 30 degrees. Now, being these are tubes, um, you can put a dielectric in them to support the polarization, um, such as water, magnetite, or uh, quartz. And so, if there is water, Oh, okay, there we go. Alright, so tube, we have water inside, and the water is going to align that to that. It's an electric dipole. It aligns to the supporting um, the electric polarization. So you're getting these basically are inductive capacitors. Um, and also relates to why everything's hollow. And so even though we're looking at 2D geometry, we're looking at linear first dimensional aspects of 2D geometry. Just like if I was looking at the sphere, which is 3D geometry, it's really hollow in terms of what we're doing because we're looking at the planar 2D information around the sphere. You understand how, it's all, how the two different dimensions interrelate into the one dimension. So this also relates to why the Earth is actually hollow in that the gravitic points are along the circle at the edge. So like uh, this poi here, all right, the gravitational node is at the end of the poi. And the centrifugal force, the masculine, the dominant force, is the energy moving out from my hand to the end of the poi. What you don't see, the submissive force is the vacuum. Um, the yin energy, the centripetal force getting pulled toward the poi as I spin it around, which is what we usually consider gravity to be. So, um, now, the unique aspect with this is uh, with this polarization, because you're getting this double 30 degree fractal geometry angular information, is if in this core you also put a dielectric, where the dielectric here, the insulator, supports the electric polarization, this dielectric, this dielectric reflects the electrical polarization on the outside mainly the response to these six points. And it will constantly fractalize at 30 degrees toward a singularity in the center. Thus, why a triangle is the simplest form of geometry to create energy. Because you can connect directly to a singularity in space. To thus absorb energy from the infinite, um, polarize an infinite balance into a finite existence. And so, to give you one more example, we have up here, we have uh, a, a, a quadruple helix. Um, and if you had four compression points on the outside, you'd have four vacuum points here, and four compression points here, singularity in the center, and the angle is 45 degrees um, between the charges. 
So again, it fractalizes toward a singularity in the center. And again, these all flip-flop. I'm showing these are centrifugal force in these pictures, but when, when the yin energy is applied to centripetal force, the energy is flip-flop, and so you'd have expansion on the outside, compression, expansion. Um, and so with the other helixes, I have a pentagonal, it's 54 degrees, a hexagonal, 60 degrees, a septagonal, 64.286 degrees, a octagonal, 67.5 degrees, um, a non-agonal, non 70 degrees, which is the only one that breaks down in, into a 7. I'm not sure what the 7 would break down into. All the rest break down into 9, 6s, and 3s. Um, a decagonal, 72 degrees, and a dec decagonal, 75. I want to also do 11 and 13 because they're important. I just didn't do them. Um, so that's the qualitative angular information of the electrical polarization of helical flows of geometry in terms of expansion and contraction and how they relate to fractal geometries to access singularities. And all of these access singularities except for the double helix which relates to superconductivity and this one is, has 180 degree um, um, angular information while all the rest go from 30 degrees and they approach 90 degrees. The higher you go, the closer you'll approach 90 degrees because say you have a the marker is dying. Tons and tons and tons and tons of circles going around. You have a compression point here, 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 expansion point. The bigger this gets, the more straighter um, this gets. But it's not 180 degrees because the expansions on the outside, or the compression points would be outside, the expansion points would be here. And it always would approach a 90 degree angle. It would never technically reach a 90 degree angle unless you had an infinite amount of circles. Um, then the angle would be 90 degrees. And so there's the really big concept of how centrifugal force and centripetal force relate to the two pieces of geometry to where you don't need to wire um, things around forms anymore. You can just wrap the conductors around themselves. You put an insulator inside them to help support the electrical polarization. If you put an insulator in the core of, say, a triple helix, it allows you to access zero point energy. And so, whew, yes, this is cool stuff. This is really cool stuff. Um, and uh, these are all the linear forms of the energy. And if you turn them into themselves, they'll create cyclical forms of the energy as exhibited in the star geometries. So, that's the basis to electricity and magnetism um, and magnetism is a flow of the energy um, as I was talking about oh, in, in this image the flow of the energy around um, while well, the electrical aspects are the compression and expansion of that flow um, and they're at 90 degrees to each other as traditional physics has noted they just stuck on the effect, they don't see the cause. Um, so the next notion would be how these uh, toruses move together um, to create uh, uh, 3D geometries, such as the platonic solids, to um, move into the third dimension. And that's a whole other topic. Uh, but I just laid out the first and second dimension in simple context. And we have the matrix code for the second dimension, how electromagnetic energies want to flow. I haven't covered that for the hexagram and the octagram. I still haven't really figured out the pentacle, honestly. Or a, a number sequence that I'm comfortable with the pentacle. Have for the dodecagram. Um, those are all on vortex space if you want to look at them and interpret how those energies flow. And so, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this um, am amalgamation of information. Yeah. And uh, um, hopefully this angular information thing, which I feel like is the most important really new stuff, which I haven't shared with anyone, uh, will hopefully get some minds thinking in a good direction. It may help also facilitate opening this heart in a very beautiful all direction with everything. It's pretty fun. Um, and so... Uh, uh.
Yeah, the world is crazy right now. I'm in Asheville. I'd love help. I have some funding. If people want to fund me on the work I'm doing. That'd be great. Don't have a computer anymore. Um, and uh, but I'm I'm good at living out of a backpack and and pulling all this together and living as minimal as possible. I do have my own place, which is great. I've manifested with you know no money. I've been working about 40 plus hours a week, with earning nothing. But I'm learning a lot. I'm building a lot. I'm doing a lot. Um, it's pretty cool, and uh, I, I really hope to, I know I am, giving birth to the metaphysical sciences and bringing it into our reality in a very fruitful and beautiful way, and applying it, not just, you know, teaching it is applying it, sharing it with you, and uh, building really cool things, um, like this, and Tesla Towers, and other cool, awesome things, and, uh, uh, I'm not going to share everything I'm working on. If you came here in person, I'd share a lot more. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful world. And who knows what's going to happen this week. It's going to be crazy, I'll tell you. It's going to be crazy. It feels great. Um, everything's just sort of like chiming in perfectly in terms of the drumbeat and where our awareness, our scientific realizations, how we relate to each other and ourselves. Uh, everything's connected, everything's flowing, everything just makes sense. It's awesome. It's really, really awesome. So, I hope you took a bit out of this. You want to ask questions, I'll make more videos. I can upload from my phone. I'm out here in this trailer in the woods. <laughs> and so I'm not completely isolated from everyone. Um, I am like a 20 minute bike ride from downtown Nashville, which is cool. Um, I do get out for dance church on Sundays, which is awesome. It's off the wall. Pretty cool. Went to full-on delirium this weekend. And, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed everything, and I will let you go, and namaste, and happy journeys, especially with this week. Ciao.